Get up out of your seats. Let's hear it for Steve Case. Here we go. Thank you. You can sit down now. Well, welcome to Silicon Valley. Good to be back. Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, how, so, I, you know, I, I've interviewed a lot of founders, but I don't interview a lot of New York Times number one bestsellers. And so I'm a little bit flustered tonight. So I hope you'll... Good. That's probably to my advantage. Forgive me a little bit. Um, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, t t take, us, take us back a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about um, some of your earliest memories of being an entrepreneur. Uh, you, you could start with AOL. You could start well before that if you'd like. Um, and I know you talk about, in the, in the book, you talk about how everyone goes through uh, you know, tremendously difficult experiences along that journey. I wonder if, if you would just talk about your roots about entrepreneurship a little bit and tell us uh, about some of the more kind of poignant memories that you have that were difficult along that road. Sure. Well, it's great to be here and uh, Derek and Startup Grind, and we've been partners on a number of different initiatives, including our Rise of the Rest road trips around the country. Uh, and so it's great to be here, and, and, and thanks to you all for coming out. Uh, in terms of my kind of backstory, it, you know, I was did like many of you I probably did kind of a variety of entrepreneurial things when I was a kid. Nothing really amounted to anything, but I learned a lot. Uh, and then I, uh, when I was in college, happened to read up in 1980, happened to read a book uh, by Alvin Toffler called The Third Wave, uh, which really was mesmerizing and sort of inspired me to kind of. You know, he basically said the first wave was the agricultural revolution, the second wave was the industrial revolution, the third wave was, was going to be the technology revolution. Essentially, now 36 years ago, uh, talked about the internet. And back then it wasn't, you know, it was still more of a concept, uh, but I thought it was really, you know, pretty interesting. So I, I wanted to do that when I was graduating. Um, there was no, like, internet companies to go to back then in 1980, so that was not an option. And frankly, there wasn't much of a startup culture back then either, so that wasn't really an option. Uh, so I ended up going to work for two big companies for a few years, two years at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, and then one year at the division of, of, of PepsiCo, uh, Pizza Hut, for about a year. And then finally moved to the D.C. area in 1983 to join a startup that was doing something in the online world, which I was sure was going to be the next big thing. And like, you know, a month after I got there, you know, the, you know they laid off like 80% of their staff. And it's like, oh, like, oh, welcome to startup world. <laughs> this, is, this is not quite what I thought. Uh, and so we struggled with that for a couple of years. But eventually, two of the other people I met there, Jim Kimsey and Mark Seraph, and I co-founded uh, AOL in 1985. Uh, and at the time, I know it sounds crazy, particularly for the younger folks here. But back then, 31 years ago, when we started, 3% of Americans were online. And they were online on average one hour per week. So when we said we wanted to get America online, that actually was the aspiration. Uh, and it took a decade. And it was a lot of you know, fits and starts and you know, two steps forward, one step back. And there were you know, some times where we really think, didn't think we were going to make it. It looked like we were, couldn't raise a funding or a partnership. We, thought was important was blowing up or, you know, a whole host of things, which are pretty typical for that startup journey. But thankfully, we stuck with it. And eventually, again, in the mid-90s in particular, things really uh, accelerated. What's, uh, it, let's talk about a few of the experiences of that that, that uh, you know, you, you talk about a lot of these things in, in the third wave in your new book. Um, one of those is this partnership that you did with Apple, which was like blood, sweat, and tears, and then sort of saved you guys, and then you kind of, it, it just took all these twists and turns. Could you talk to us a little bit about, about that experience and, you know, a startup, you know, doing a deal with a, with a big company at the time? How did, that, how did that come about? I'm happy to talk about it, but it does give me a little post-traumatic stress just to go <laughs> back and think about it. Now, the, 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 the back story there is when we started in 1985, uh, we raised $1 million of venture capital. Uh, and at the time, there were some other big players uh, that were circling some big companies like AT&T and Knight Ritter and GE and, and others were kind of, you know, Reader's Digest. There a bunch of people were doing different things. But one in particular that was had got announced was IBM and Sears 
announced a joint venture they ended up calling Prodigy, and it committed $1 billion to launch Prodigy. So we, like, we had $1 million, they had $1 billion. <laughs> Didn't seem like hand-to-hand -hand combat would be the way to go. So our strategy for the you know, first five years or so was essentially partners. You know, we, we essentially were doing private label, white label services. So the first one we did was with Commodore. At the time, the Commodore 64 was the number one home computer, and we created a service called Q-Link. And then we did one with uh, Radio Shack, Tandy, which at the time was a pretty big personal computer company. We created a service called PC-Link. Then we partnered with IBM to create a service called Promenade. And then we partnered with Apple to create a service called Apple Inc. Personal Edition. And I, you know, it was such a big deal. I actually moved from D.C. to San Francisco, got an apartment here for six months. Every day showed up at the Apple offices trying to find somebody. Is that, yeah, I, I mean, that's what this, that's, is that right? That's like you true. just sat in the lobby or did you well, have I, people I, to meet? Did you always have a I meeting? I knew some or? people to meet, but no, I, I kind of, it was, it was pretty pathetic, to be honest. It was I basically... <laughs> Showing up every day, and it, finally, after a couple months, somebody there. You're like trailing people in as they walk through security well, and things, or maybe a little bit, yeah. Uh, but after a couple months, I got a consultant badge. Oh, that's nice. They, they, they're tired of signing me in and out, so I, they, somebody <laughs> signed me up as a consultant, and then I actually found an empty cubicle and would you know hang out there for a little while. Uh, but eventually, kind of, you know, I think I wore them down, and they decided to you know, do this deal. Maybe just to get rid of me, I don't know. But it would, it would, you know, do this deal. To, and uh, we launched it um, in some fanfare, raised some money to, to launch it. Uh, but then about a year into it, uh, they really decided they didn't like the partnership. Uh, they didn't like, you know, they had never licensed the Apple brand name to any other company. And they regretted doing that. Uh, and they also were having basically battles over marketing. We were trying to give away software for free. They wanted to sell software. We were trying to give it away to, through a lot of channels. They wanted to force everybody to go to Apple authorized stores. So just was a lot of conflict about marketing distribution. We just didn't see the world the same way. Of course, now their resurgent is in large part through an app store where software is generally free and not in the store. But be that as it may, that, you know, the 30 years ago they were not. You know, that was not their. 25 years ago, that was not their their mindset. So finally, they called us and said, "We're going to cancel the deal. We just un unhappy with this. It was a mistake." Uh, and we went back and forth, and they basically, you know, paid us a few million dollars to go away quietly, uh, which we did. But then we had to, we couldn't call it Apple Inc. Personal Edition anymore. And so we ended up having a little internal competition, and America Online won. So we rebranded America Online. And, and then, you know, a year or two later, started getting some traction. So what looked like a crisis, I think a lot of people thought we we're going to hit the wall, we weren't, you know, weren't going to survive that, you know, the death of the Apple partnership. You know, turned out to be actually opened a door that ended up you know taking us to new heights. Well, and that was and also part of that. If I correct me if I'm wrong, that was a big part of how you raised venture capital and got people on board and things like that. And then, and and I think as an entrepreneur who who's been doing it for seven years or however long these people have been doing it, you have that moment where oh you're up here and then all of a sudden boom, like the floor falls out, and then you kind of navigated this lemonade out of a bunch of lemons and you managed to get them to give you money in order to get out of the partnership, which m most people might have just said, hey, we're just, you know, you're done. We're done with you. And you, you managed to actually get something out of it and keep going. No, I, think, I, think they, I think they realize that, you know, that they, their decision to cancel a deal created problems for us. We had raised a few million dollars to basically be able to launch this thing. So I think they... They, they felt they should pay something. It was really more a debate about, you know, what the number should be. Um, and, you know, it did create some tension. I, I, some of those in, that new investors who invested because they thought the Apple partnership was such a wonderful thing, you know, were kind of freaked out. And there were some people who thought maybe I should get fired. And so that was, that was uh, not a great time. But, uh, you know, eventually, eventually it was, we were able to kind of, uh, you know, kind of turn it around. I think there are a lot of those, you know, kind of, examples where, and one of the things I talk about in the book, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, frankly, is some of the lessons learned in what I call the Internet's first wave, uh, I think are going to be applicable in the Internet's third wave, but were less true in this last 10 or 15 years for the Internet's second wave. And so that's what literally led me to kind of write a book mostly about the future, trying to talk about where things are going, uh, but I did include some of the stories about some of those early days, less because I think people are interested in 
those stories are kind of a memoir kind of thing, because I don't think that many people are, but mostly because, as Shakespeare said, sometimes the past is prologue and some of the lessons from that first wave I think are going to be helpful to, to the innovators in the, in the third wave. So let's, let's talk about that. What You have these kind of three Ps of, of what's coming and what, what will be relevant in the third wave. Let's, one of those is partnerships, right? Is that right. working, let's start there. Why, why are partnerships going to be so critical in, in this next phase of, of entrepreneurship? Well, the three Ps uh, that I think are going to you know, be important are partnership, policy, and perseverance. But maybe uh, for, for those of you who uh, have not as, as read the book yet, I'm sure there's some of you out there who just wandered in Same here now wondering people. where you are. But for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, let me frame it in terms of what the three waves are, and then I'll go into the, the, the three Ps. Uh, the, the first wave was building the Internet. Uh, and as I said, when we got started, nobody was online, nobody really cared, nobody felt they were missing anything. It just seemed kind of a weird hobbyist phenomenon kind of for a few weird people. Uh, by the end of the first wave, kind of year 2000 or so, it had gone from nobody was online to everybody was online and from nobody cared about it to you couldn't live without it. And that was the foundational technologies, the software, the networks, the servers, the essentially building the on-ramps to get people connected and educating people about why they, they get connected. So that really was the, the first wave, which then set off the second wave, which has been the last 15 years or so, uh, which is building apps and services on top of the internet. That's really been, been the focus. And the, you know, the great iconic companies of the second wave, like Google and Facebook and Twitter and Waze and you know, Snapchat, you can kind of make up your own list, basically with software, usually apps, running on top of the phone, on top of the internet, and in most cases running on phones. You know, the first wave was more about PCs, second wave obviously was more about, you know, mobile uh, devices, particularly smartphones. Uh, and that's really been where a lot of the momentum has been in this past uh, decade. Obviously, huge success in Facebook now, like 1.6 billion users. And at the beginning of the second wave called the year 2000, not only was Facebook not founded, I think Mark Zuckerberg was like in 14 years old. You know, I don't think he was even in high school yet. So that just shows you the pace at which this, this um, second wave kind of you know, took hold. And there will still be opportunities for other apps and services kind of running on top of the Internet. But you know, I think the third wave is now emerging, and that's going to integrate the Internet in some interesting and, and seamless and pervasive and sometimes even invisible ways, and in the process have the opportunity to really revolutionize in pretty significant ways things like healthcare, things like education, things like transportation, energy, food, uh, a lot of financial services, uh, smart cities and, and, and autonomous cars and sensors and Internet of Things. There's just a lot of things that are, that are in, you know, just in, in development uh, that are really going to accelerate in this, in this third wave. But the playbook, I think, for this third wave is going to be more like the first wave, uh, and, and that's where the three Ps come in. So partnership, you know, what we learned with that first wave was you can't go alone. There's an African proverb I say, if you want to go quickly, you can go alone, but if you want to go far, you must go together. We had 300 partnerships at AOL. The, 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 and, uh, you know, that would not, the Internet would not be part of everyday life without a lot of companies working together, collaboratively doing their part. Partnerships were essential. In the second wave, not so much. Facebook actually didn't need partnerships. Snapchat didn't need partnerships. It was more about creating a great app and having it break through the, the noise and, and get, get attention and then be spread virally so it went from a small thing to a big thing and basically without partners you know, for, for the most part. Uh, uh, partners will become important again in this third way because while some of the revolution education will come with apps and, and learning in the cloud, a lot of it's going to happen in classrooms, you know, fourth grade classrooms and university, you know, kind of, uh, kind of uh, classrooms and, and integrating technology there will require partnerships with teachers and professors and schools and universities and not just, you know, kind of apps in the cloud. Similarly, healthcare, there's been some innovation, obviously, in the, in the second wave, better consumer information about health, things like that. Uh, but if we're really going to significantly put a dent in, in sort of the you know, healthcare system, better outcomes, more convenience, lower costs, it's going to require actually working with like the doctors and working with the hospitals and figuring out ways to kind of partner with them to, uh, to, to move us forward. So this partnership is going to become a, a really big uh, deal. Policy is going to become a big deal too. Most of these sectors are regulated. 
you know, the drugs we take and the food we eat and the, you know, the cars we, we drive or have, have autonomous vehicles driving for us are going to be regulated. You can debate what the regulations should be. Maybe they should be different. Maybe there should be a lighter touch. But there are going to be some regulations because these are pretty fundamental aspects of our lives. So the innovators that are tackling these problems have to engage on policy, have to understand regulations, have to talk to government. Again, second wave, for the most part, that wasn't necessary. It was more about the software, more about the, the app. And the third is, is perseverance. In that first wave, you know, we were not alone in being a 10-year in the making overnight success. We were at it and at it and at it, slogging away until finally we, we, we broke through. Second wave, there were a lot of truly overnight successes, Facebook and, and Snapchat among them. Uh, it went from being an idea in a dorm room to being a pretty significant, valuable company, essentially overnight, you know, a year, year or two. Uh, and I think in the third wave, it, because these are difficult problems, require partnership, re require engagement policy, I think it'd be harder, it'd take, take longer. So that's the, you know, the framing of these, these, uh, these waves and that's sort of the, the three Ps, which as I said, were essential in the first wave, not as essential for most companies in the second wave, I think will become essential again in the third wave. If I want to take on something as big as healthcare or education or, and, and disrupt that and have an impact on that, as, as you say, it's coming, where, where do I start? I mean, where, where do I, if I'm, it's me and my co-founder, where, where do we start? Do we start with the policymakers? Do we start with the partnerships? Do we start at the drawing board, at the whiteboard, like where, how, no, does no, that change? It, I think it still starts with the idea, starts with the product, starts with the service, uh, and and uh, then you figure out ways to essentially bring it to market and build a kind of a, almost a network around your your idea. Uh, but I also think in the third wave, while the, the, the role of engineers will still be obviously critical and critically important, in many of these sectors, having some domain expertise and credibility is also gonna be important. Uh, so some of the most innovative uh, companies in in, uh, in education, ed tech, actually are started by former teachers. There's, as you know from some of your work with Startup Grind, uh, New Orleans, for example, is a really innovative ed tech cluster, uh, in part because Katrina devastated New Orleans, devastated the school system. They decided to re restart with a, essentially a clean slate, a charter school network, hired a lot of people, including from Teach from Amer for America who came there. And after doing that for a while, in a, in a school system that was much open, more open to trying stuff than almost any other school system in the country, uh, a bunch of people decided to move out of being teachers and being into entrepreneurs. And it's, it's, it's growing quite, quite uh, robustly. And I think similarly in, in healthcare, if you really have a you know, better way to manage diabetes or, uh, or, or deal with cancer or other kinds of things, you know, getting some, some folks who actually have been doctors and done it firsthand, I think, will be important to inform your perspective in terms of what you should build and also give you credibility to then be able to sell it into Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic or, or, or something like that. So I think it starts with the, with, the, with the idea, what you're trying to accomplish, but I think it also, you know, requires having a more diverse team of people uh, in all respects uh, that kind of surround that idea and then figuring out how to go beyond thinking of it just as a technology solution, a software solution, an app, to figuring out how it can be integrated uh, in, in these systems, uh, which again is hard. I'm not, I'm not you know, in, in when I talk to you know, most um, entrepreneurs about this and, and talk about the three Ps, it's kind of a bummer. Partnerships are hard. Policy's hard. Perseverance is hard. It'd be easier if you could go it alone. It'd be easier if there were no regulations, and it'd be easier if it was an overnight success. I get that. But I also get that the, you know, if you're really going to take a serious whack at some of these you know, sectors, which I would argue are the most important aspects of our lives, like how we stay healthy, how our kids learn, how we move around, you know, what we eat. You know, these are pretty fundamental you know, things, which is not to say that you know, a photo app or a dating app or, is not useful too, but this is pretty fundamental stuff. It's going to be harder, and and you know some people will run from that, some will run to it, and I think in the third wave, the, the, the my guess is the uh, next iconic entrepreneurs will take on some of these challenges, but bring a different mindset and a different playbook to bear. Let's let's talk about policy for a minute, and uh, you are, are famous for saying that America was once a startup, which is a which is a great. A great quote, and it's true. Um, 
what are we now? Is America like IBM or something? Or what, what, where, would you, where would you put us at this point uh, from how far we've no, come and, and what's, what's happening? I think, it's, I think we're still pretty well positioned. I mean, the, 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 you know, the framing of that, we've done this together, is that I, I remind people, particularly in Washington, D.C., uh, that 250 years ago, America itself was a startup. It was just an idea. A few people floated over on boats with the idea of a better life. And it went from this tiny little startup nation to the leader of the free world. And largely because of the fact that it went from this non-existent economy to the leading economy in the world. And that did not happen by accident. It was the work of entrepreneurs first in the agricultural revolution, then the industrial revolution, then the technology revolution, as Toffler said, uh, that really kind of led the way and took America from where it was to its, you know, its position in, in the world. So I think that is the, the history. And right now we still have a lead, uh, but we have seen, particularly over the last decade, uh, the globalization of entrepreneurship. 50 years ago we saw the globalization of capital. 50 years ago we saw the globalization of, of, of things like uh, entertainment. We saw the globalization of manufacturing. Now we're seeing the globalization of entrepreneurship. And if you travel around the world, as you do with Startup Grind, there are a bunch of countries that kind of have figured out that the secret sauce that's made America great is innovation and entrepreneurship. And they're saying, well, hmm, maybe we should do more of that. Maybe we should invest more in basic research. Maybe we should create the right regulatory kind of infrastructure. Maybe we should create the right investment incentives. Maybe we should, you know, create the right or put in place the right immigration policy to attract talent and, and win was now a global battle for talent. So the battle's been joined and I think we can continue to, you know, kind of lead the way, but only if we, you know, recognize the importance of it, deal with some of those issues uh, ourselves, which is one of the you know, the parts of the book, I call it my the, my manifesto chapter, what it takes to, you know, keep America kind of in in the uh, in, in the lead, uh, and that I would say, and I say this with with you know with tremendous respect for everything that's happening in Silicon Valley. I really do. It's amazing what's 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 happening happening here, and will continue to happen here. Uh, but if we're going to remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation, we need to make sure innovation and job creation is alive and well all across the country, and we need to make sure investors are paying attention to what entrepreneurs are building all across the country which is the point of this rise of the rest effort. Last year, 75% of venture capital went to California, New York, and Massachusetts, three states. And while there are great things happening in California, I'm sure you're involved in some of them, uh, great things happening in New York, great things happening in Massachusetts, 75% of the great things are not happening in those three states. Yet that's, you know, most of the media focus, most of the investor focus is on those. That has to change. And oh, by the way, there are different statistics, but about 90% of that venture capital went to men, 10% to women. Overwhelmingly, uh, kind of also, uh, it's not just the guys, but mostly the white guys. And so I don't think we can, in fact, I know, we cannot you know, re re remain that leader if we're investing in a few places and a few people in, in, a, in a few places. So we've got to level the playing field. We've got to kind of make a, have a more inclusive approach to entrepreneurship that's not defined by place or, or person. Uh, and you know, that's one of the big things I think will happen and needs to happen as this third wave takes off. And oh, by the way, the reason I'm confident it will happen, again, I say this you know, recognizing I'm like in the heart of Silicon Valley, is some of the industries that are going to be disrupted, I've mentioned some healthcare and education and so forth, actually are in the middle of the country. The, you know, 75% of the Fortune 500 companies are in, not on the coast, they're in the middle of the country. And if partnerships are more important, some of those partnerships will be closer to those companies. And there are great things happening. You look at any sector, you know, take ag tech as an example, agriculture technology, actually great, great things happening in Silicon Valley. I think a lot of things, great things will continue to happen in Silicon Valley. But you know what? Also a lot of great things are happening in like Louisville, Kentucky, which understands farming. And if I had to bet one, on one city in the next uh, you know, decade on ag tech, it'd be St. Louis. Why? They've got big companies like Monsanto there with tens of thousands of engineers who understand farming. Some of them are going to do startups. And I'll bet you there's 100 ag tech startups in St. Louis. A lot of those people know a lot about 
agriculture. Yeah. And and so, you know, it, it's it, we which need to make sure that that you know, people want to be here in New York or Boston or have you. Obviously, they should be here. Uh, but if they want to be some other place, how do we make it easier for them to start companies or scale companies e everywhere? Um, and that you know, entrepreneurship dynamic is not just we're not just seeing the entrepreneurs regionalized within the country. We're also seeing it globalized around the world. How many people here are not from Silicon Valley? Raise your hand. It's almost the whole room. I mean, it's probably 70 percent of the whole of the room. And and this is what's been so interesting to me about the rise of the rest tour, which which you started and and came out of kind of this bus tour phenomenon from the AOL days and then, you know, at where you guys would go city to city. And, and this is like, it's like, a, it's like a presidential campaign and the president is entrepreneurship, you know? And like, you go, you go from city to city and we go to Buffalo and then we go to, you know, Manchester and then we go to, you know, Atlanta. And it's like just the energy and the amount of, you know, the amount, the sheer quantity, but also the quality of entrepreneurs coming out of those places, it's everyone in this room who, who is now here at the moment is here, um, but it's these same people in all these different cities. And, and they're, building, they're building, as you say, they're bu building kind of city specific or in, in some cases like, you know, things that are perfect for that city. In DC, it might be a security company or in, you know, we all know, you know, B Boston and, 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 and the domain expertise there in New York, but even, you know, in Buffalo or in, in, in Pittsburgh or in, Philadelphia, it's just incredible to see, and, and you have gone and like picked the very best and, and funded, I think it's about 35 companies in dozens of cities. Um, and what, like, uh, the, the impact, I think, you know, it's been in the last few years, and we'll see this kind of trail out, but it's like, it feels like it's, it's kind of like that first jolt that a lot of entrepreneurs need, where it's like, even though some of them have funding, but it's like, hey, somebody that I've heard of finally put their stamp of approval on this person, and they were great before, but now it kind of wakes everybody up to like, wow, look at, you know, Steve Case, you know, invest in this company or, you know, really like this company. It just, it, it's created a lot of, I think, a really a lot of positive outcomes. Well, I, I appreciate that. It's still, it's still early days. It's a little bit like, you know, with, with AOL that when we started, it was 3% of people online and most people were skeptical about whether people would get online. I know they're, you know, you run into a lot of people who say, well, I actually disagree. I think all great innovation will continue to be in Silicon Valley and New York and, and Boston. Uh, and there are a lot of people who have that view, but it's beginning to change. Part of the reason I'm in town today is Google hosted for the third year in a row uh, essentially a demo day to support regional entrepreneurship. There are 11 companies from 11 cities around the country. We have some, the winner here tonight. Some, uh, some actually. Canada. We do. Where's the cup? Who's got Where's the, the cup? cup? Hold it up. Yeah, Hold the it. cop. The cop. <laughs> from from uh, full of milk. Minneapolis. Yeah. Uh, so Alcohol that's that's an example. And and the interesting thing is in that room were a hundred or so venture capitalists based here from the top firms, uh, and they're kind of saying, you know, yes, we understand. You know, our, 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 for the most part, the you know the the, the playbook for venture capital in this region for the last decade is you get in the car and you drive to the company. You know, in the third wave, there'll be much more getting on a plane to, you know, to visiting these cities and seeing, seeing what's happening. There are a couple other examples just to, to, to highlight this. Uh, and again, I, I want to be really clear. I'm not suggesting Silicon Valley is going to lose momentum. I'm actually suggesting that will continue to be strong, but these other places will rise and gain uh, momentum and the even the rise of the rest concept is something actually that originally the gap will narrow basically for uh, the more opportunity will be just you know more broadly dispersed uh, examples so one of the most interesting health IT companies that really is beginning to kind of revolutionize you know healthcare and hospital technology particularly around electronic medical records is a company called epic systems they're in Madison Wisconsin they have 10,000 employees in Madison Wisconsin uh, one of the you know, most interesting companies that started in athletic wear, created a brand, but now is doing a lot of things in health tech, is Under Armour. They're in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, one of the hottest virtual reality companies that's raised $1.3 billion of venture capital, including from Google and Alibaba, is not in Palo Alto or Boston. It's in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a company called Magic Leap. So you're, you're just beginning to see, there, and, and there's a half a dozen uh, enterprise software, SaaS 
uh, uh, companies on one street in Provo, Utah. So, you know, this is, this is not just completely like, I think the rest is going to rise. The rest is rising. And we're just trying to do what we can to yeah. help accelerate that and, and showcase that. How, let, let's talk about perseverance. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is, this is a, it's so simple, but actually I've just found over the last seven years since I quit my job, uh, my corporate America job, that like the people that are ultimately successful seem to be the people that survive the longest. Like, you know, you, you have to be somewhat smart. You have to be able to recruit a team and all these, you, you know, have, you know, talk to customers and have insights. But really, like, even people with really bad ideas, if they're here long enough, I feel like they eventually bump into something, some good idea along the way and figure it out and, and get back on and run with it. But most people don't ever survive that long. They end up just giving up. And, and, um, and so, like, I, w I wonder, like, how, how, do I, how do I work my perseverance muscles? Like, how do, I, how do I develop more perseverance? How do I develop more stamina to stay in the game longer? What, 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 you know, what, what would you say to somebody that's saying, hey, I'm, I'm about to give up or I think I'm going to need to give up? Like, what, what do I do to survive? Well, obviously, there's sometimes where you should give up. You know, it actually is a dumb idea. You're saying to me I should give yeah, up? You know, no, 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 I'm not saying in every case you, you should persevere. You have to pay attention to what you know, the feedback is. But I think the key is, is kind of keeping an eye on the prize, keeping it, you know, what, what's the light at the end of the tunnel? What is the battle you're fighting? What is the mountain you're climbing? And is there still a logical reason why someday that actually is going to happen? And do you have a reasonable kind of understanding of the context, competition, and so forth. So there actually is a path to make that happen. In my case, you know, there, there were, as I said earlier, some, uh, you know, some dark days. There, there really were some, some points in time where it didn't look like we we're going to make it. And there were some times where people left the company mostly because they just didn't think it was going to survive and figured they'd go better you know, get on to something else. And there were definitely many times where, like my parents would call me and say, Steve? This, this is why I knew where we were going. Steve, we love you. <laughs> and we're proud of you. But it doesn't seem like your online thingy is working. <laughs> Do you have like a plan B? Do you like, is, it, is it time to maybe get a, like a real job? And, and I understood their concern because actually the, they were right. It, was, it wasn't working. Uh, but I kept saying, but it's going to work. I know the idea of the internet, which I know seems dumb now, because we take it for granted, but in the 80s, it was looking iffy. The idea of the internet, the idea of a connected world, the idea of different ways to communicate with people and get information, so forth. I knew that was going to happen. I just knew it, even though it was slow going for a whole host of, of, of reasons. And so uh, that led me to kind of kind of continue to stick with it. There was, there, were, there, I, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Granted, the tunnel was long and the light was flickering, but I, I, I was able to, you know, to, to stick with it and persevere. So I think going back to your question, understanding that, and that's why some of the events you do with Startup Grind are, are, are helpful, that the, the entrepreneurial journey usually is a slog. It's usually not an overnight success. Uh, and so just understanding that and how you know, the, some of the, you know, the, you know, the great companies were built uh, over, usually over time, usually with more of a built to last than a built to flip kind of you know mindset, I think helps inform that you know that perspective. And there are people that will say, no, I'd rather focus on you know something uh, that's a little easier to define, and if it if it works, I'll continue to run run with it, or I'll sell it to somebody and go off and do something else. And there are a lot of very successful serial entrepreneurs that have done a, a number of of things, usually around products as opposed to platforms. Um, and that's fine. I, I'm, I'm, I'll celebrate any entrepreneur anywhere doing anything. Because I think that you know, is such a key part of, of, of uh, you know, what makes us great. But I will particularly celebrate the entrepreneurs that are taking on some of the more difficult challenges, but also opportunities uh, in our communities and, and taking on a little bit different mindset where perseverance does matter. There's a recognition that partnerships will increasingly matter. There's a recognition uh, the engaging on policy will become increasingly important. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience here in just a few minutes. Uh, I just want to ask you, I'm going to go quickly round robin, a couple of quick questions. 
One, at, at one point, a young Mark Andreessen reported into you when you bought his little big company, Netscape. What's, uh, what was he like at the time? And, and you know, do you have any, any insights on, you know, Mark Andreessen reporting into, into you in no, the late, late, we, late we, 80s, was it? Was it, was it no, it was the 90s. Early, mid 90s? Late 90s, 90s, I think. We, we, we Nin- went, we went oh, uh, close. the history for those who don't know, we went public in 1992 as the first internet company to go public. And in that IPO, we raised $10 million. <laughs> and the value of the company that day was $70, 70. million. Yeah. Uh, and the reason it was, you know, and the interest in institutional investors was pretty modest. It's like, feels like kind of a niche niche thing. And then seven years later, we'd gone from 184,000 customers to 25 million and from a $70 million market value to $160 billion. And as that stock was rising, we made it several dozen acquisitions in the whole host of, you know, computer network side and content side, launched a greenhouse, you know, acquired Netscape, a bunch of, bunch of things that we were, were doing to kind of broaden our portfolio of businesses before then, obviously, doing the merger with, with Time Warner. So one of those was the acquisition of Netscape, and as part of that, Mark agreed to stay on as CTO reporting to me, and he moved to Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, and lived there for know, a year, year and a half. Uh, and was actually very, very uh, insightful in terms of some of the you know things that he thought were going to happen next. That did help inform some of our uh, of our thinking. Uh, but ultimately, wanted to, it was sort of a more of a staff kind of role. He decided he wanted to be an entrepreneur and moved moved back here and started with uh, Ben Horowitz, a, a software company that pivoted a couple of times, and then obviously now has moved into the venture capital world with with, with great success. So he was, he was a terrific guy then, and, and terrific guy now. Um. One thing I thought was really interesting in how, just a sense of how things have changed is you, very early in the company, you owned about 3% of AOL, right? And and I wonder, like, as you see entrepreneurs, which I, th- I think was very standard at the time, and now we see, you know, Mark Zuckerberg at an IPO is at about 30%. The Atlassian guys, it's like the best IPO, you know, the last tech IPO of the last 12 months. They, they were at about 37% each, uh, you know, um, do you see, you know, what, what do you tell entrepreneurs who are trying to maintain equity, trying to protect their equity? Do you have any advice for them at the earliest stages of how, how to better protect yourself and, and, and well, the value you're creating? It, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And actually, in that era, in the 80s, early 90s, in general, the entrepreneurs did own more of the company. Bill Gates owned a lot more of Microsoft, and as, a, as an example. Michael Dell owned a lot more of, of, of Dell. You can kind of go through the list. But what was unusual in our circumstance is it essentially was viewed by our venture investors as a restart. They had lost tens of millions of dollars in that company I joined in 1983 that promptly failed. And so when we decided to launch a new company in 1985, they, some of the same investors said, you know, we'll invest, but they kind of like, wasn't just about the new thing. They kind of felt like we owed them some money from the last thing. So that's why they started with more of the company. And over time, we earned back some of the company. But I would say that, of course, owning more is better than owning less. But it's most important that you figure out the path to be successful. And you know, even though I only owned 3% of it when it was worth a lot of money, I did fine. I mean, yeah. And so in our case, sure. we needed a lot of capital. We needed we needed to use the currency for acquisitions. So that, that was dilutive. But I was not so much focused on what my slice was, I was trying to focus on like creating a really big pie. Um, we're going to take questions right after this. Uh, and that is to, you know, we live, we live in the sort of in our own bubble over on the West coast and, you know, you live in Washington DC and actually you, 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 for people that, that don't know you very well or, or that don't follow you very closely. One thing that you navigate, I think better than anybody is, working with both sides of the aisle. It's really amazing to see how you support, you support anybody with good ideas, basically. And I just wonder, like, with what is going on in our political process in America, what's, what's the gridlock in Washington? That's the Washington guys turning off your microphone. <laughs> they wait. I think that guy is insulting us. NSA, NSA said, no. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? Thank you. Uh, easy question. Um, no, I think it's been a difficult uh, period. It's certainly a difficult and noisy year, and so it's not it's not helpful. 
but somehow you know, we need to figure out some way uh, to, to rebuild the center uh, and you know, reestablish that, to me, one of the key tenets of democracy is compromise. Somehow compromise has become a bad word. You know, if you're compromising, you don't have any conviction. I think you know, I think the nature of this is you're always going to have to figure out a way to bring people together, and not everybody anybody's going to get everything they they want. And so I think that has to be the you know the the attitude. You know, you know hopefully, irrespective of who's president in January, irrespective of who controls the Congress, hopefully there'll be an environment where some of these issues that need attention, you know, I talked about you know, some of them, you know, get attention. Uh, if not, I think it does create more risk. You know that you know the United States does lose its edge in terms of being innovative and entrepreneurial. I think there's a real real risk of that, um, and so I, my just my approach for the past 30 years has been to stay out of politics, focus on policy, be super, you know, kind of nonpartisan, and just kind of figure out when when it's possible uh, to build some bridges that worked with the Jobs Act a few years ago, with Jump Starting Our Business Startups Act, where where the you know with the White House and then support of the Republican majority leader, you know, that got momentum around crowdfunding and on ramp for IPOs, things like that. We need to, you know, have that same focus on some of the issues around that are going to be important in the third wave around regulations and immigration. I think is a huge issue that that concerns me you know, greatly. Uh, so it's just a matter, of, you know, sticking with it and you know, kind of taking a long view. I'd rather have these things resolved sooner rather than later, but but uh, it's more how do you figure out how do you bring along a coalition of the willing. Uh, and, and find find ways to you know kind of get stuff done. Let's give it up for Steve Case. Thank you very much for being here.